And this Sunday, we are on commandment number two. And commandment number two says, you shall have, sorry, I just butchered it. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. We're living in an increasingly secular society here in America, but <laughs> yeah, Patrick's surprised to hear that, right? Yeah, it's shocking. Um, but the Ten Commandments, pretty familiar still to a lot of people. Younger generation, not as much, but older generation for sure, and people in, in my middle-aged generation for sure. One of the Ten Commandments that to me has always seemed a little bit odd and maybe a little bit outdated or, or antiquated is, is the second commandment about having, as the King James says, no graven images, right? No idols, no likenesses of what is in heaven or on earth or in the sea. Makes me think of uh, primitive idolatry. I've observed in India, we went to India years ago, and, and they have temples there, Hindu temples, and there's all sorts of statues and people bowing down and mantras and sacrifices and offerings. You know, I think of those primitive forms of idolatry. But we have our own forms of idolatry today as well. And so this morning what we're going to do is, is see how this, how this commandment relates to us today, how it relates to us in our culture, and like everything else, see how it points us to Christ and the good news of the gospel and how good it is that we have a relationship with God through him. How, how this too is evidence of God rescuing us. We've been saying as we've worked through the Ten Commandments, we've been saying we, we need to rethink these because I think our tendency is, naturally speaking, to, to hear the commandments as burdensome, to hear them as God laying down the law on us and, and to interpret that as a negative thing. But we've been seeing that this is a positive. This is God graciously pursuing us. He knows what is deadly to us, spiritually speaking, and he's committed to our rescue, and he has always been committed to our rescue, Old Testament, New Testament, that's been his, his uh, operating mode since the beginning of creation, is redemption, and, and so this is part of that, this fits with it, it's not like plan A and then plan B, this is all part of plan A, and it's him graciously pursuing us, seeking to persuade us that, that he is good, that he is the source of all life, and these commandments are an expression of not only God's character, but also an expression of his desire for us to, to live, for us to live in relationship with him. And they get us, they get us to, to Christ, uh, and that's where we find life. Right? So contextually, before we unpack the commandment itself, just let me remind you of the context, which also supports what I just said, which is God's redemption, because his people were slaves, right, in Egypt, and he liberated them miraculously, and now they're wandering in the wilderness, and he's giving them his law, and he's teaching them, instructing them concerning himself and his ways and what life looks like, and again, it's all part of their liberation. So when the human heart hears commandments, whether back then or today, and as Paul said, uh, I hear the commandment, thou shalt not covet, and what happens? I mean, right, right away I find myself coveting. I mean, we hear commandments and, and our natural human reaction is to go against them because of our fundamental posture and view of God and rebellion against Him. That's natural to us. But here He is communicating truth and what we need, and He is committed to in all of that our rescue and our liberation so let me read the commandment again, and let's just say a few things about it that help us not only understand its original intent, but also understand, um, which is the same really, but what it means to us today, all right? So he says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. In, in, in trying to understand this, there are two key phrases here. If we want to understand this as it relates to us today, and as it points us to the gospel with clarity, there's two key phrases here. First one being when he says, you shall not make for yourself. That idea of making something for ourselves. We're going to say a little bit about that. And the second one is when he says, you shall not worship them or serve them. 
those are the keys in us understanding this in a way deeper than how some have interpreted this. I met a guy years ago, very sad, wouldn't allow his, his kids to play with toys because of this commandment. Figurines of little action figures or animals or stuffed animals. They, they literally didn't even have pictures on the wall in their home because they were seeking to try to obey this commandment. Isn't that sad? And not surprisingly, from what I've heard through the grapevine, I don't believe any of them are walking with God anymore. Or at least some of them, it sounds like, are not. And I mean, how would that be surprising if you view God that way? If God literally is out to just to take, 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 take from us and to make our lives a miserable, sort of um, guilt-ridden, obligatory type of legalistic type of life. I mean, there is no life there. It's not, that isn't life. So some have interpreted it that way. But if we're going to understand it in how God intended it for our good, to show us what's wrong, what's deadly about our own nature, and to point us to Jesus, if we're going to understand it in that sense, we've got to consider these two phrases that are key. Okay, The first one, again, being, you shall not make for yourself an image, a likeness. So this word make goes way back. In the Old Testament, it's used throughout, but it be, the first time it's used is in Genesis 1. And guess who the maker is in Genesis 1? Can you guess? God's the maker. So he, he creates all different things, and there's places where it says he makes. Okay, So he made the sun, and he made the moon, and he says he made the, the beasts of the earth, the animals. I mean, he, he made them. He, he's the maker. And God has unique ability to make things. First of all, unlike us, he can make something out of nothing. We can't do that. Even the most magnificent things that we make here on earth, think of, I don't know, skyscrapers or other beautiful structures or impressive buildings or stadiums like these professional sports stadiums that are so amazing and impressive. Uh, unlike us, he makes things out of nothing. We take, we take created things and sort of reform them, but, but he can create out of nothing. And another thing he can do that we can't do, despite all our technological advancements is he can create life and you hear about the scientists and their their advancements in terms of cloning and things like that but i mean to to make to create life can't do that god is the maker he is the greatest maker he is the one true maker he is the maker with a capital m and he says you are not to make images, likenesses of the things that I've created. And he gives the examples again of heaven and earth and in the sea and, and thinking of animals. And, and most particularly, this is because in those days, the, the pagans, the other people who did not know God, that was their religious practice was to create these statues, these idols and icons, and to bow before them and to sacrifice for them. And that was their way sort of of shrinking, shrinking the divine down and making it all manageable. And so they had gods of fertility and gods that would bless their crops and their military endeavors and so on and so forth. And so God says, look, you, you're my people. And that is not life for you. That would be deadly for you to try to shrink me down to in your, in your God, little g, godness ever since the fall, since you are not sufficient in of yourselves, you will create these gods for yourself that will provide for you. He said, look, that's all death. That's all ignoring me. That's all rejecting me. That's all death to you. So you, you shall not do that. This was uh, interesting. So I credit David Bragg for this. We're in men's meeting the other day. And he brought up the Ikea effect. So you've all heard of Ikea, the store. I think the nearest one, is the nearest one up there Renton or something? Is it Renton? Yeah, we've been there once before. Uh, probably you have furniture from Ikea, at least some of you do. But probably you have not heard of the Ikea effect. Have you heard the Ikea effect? This is literally like a psychological term now that, again, David told me about the other day. So here's what, if you look it up, here's what it says about the Ikea effect, Okay. It says it's a cognitive bias, those are fancy terms, a cognitive bias in which consumers place a disproportionately high value on products they partially created. So you know when you get something at Ikea, you have to build it, usually. And they say you actually view it as having more value because you built it. 
even though you didn't create it, you didn't, you know, go in your wood shop and make it, you took all their parts and sometimes they even give you the Allen wrench you need to use and everything else. But I mean, you built it, you spent time and energy on it. And they say somehow, some way they tapped into this sort of secret of human psychology. People appreciate more something they worked on with their own hands. It says something about us, doesn't it? Kind of what we take, uh, and this isn't all negative. I know it may sound negative the way I'm presenting. It's not all negative, but we take pride in what we make. We love them, the Made in America stamp, right? And we should. There's something appropriate about that. But there's also this dynamic that is toxic, that is deadly. And this is where we start to get to the heart of the, the issue here. And this is what God's trying to res- rescue us from is there is life for us in seeing that absolutely everything we have comes from him, including our ability to make things that that from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him belongs the glory. And for us to act like little G gods and to make things for ourselves that we will that we will attribute great value to, that we will make great sacrifices for, that we will worship and serve, literally that word worship, bow down before, and the idea of services like this, reverent service, which all speaks of value, to say we put more value on what we make than God himself. And couldn't we say that relates to not only physical things, but even other endeavors in life where we try to, we try to make for ourselves a certain career or we try to, we try to build our, our family a certain way? And if everything in terms of our security and our sense of significance and our hope for satisfaction, if all that's wrapped up in what we're trying to do and make with our own hands, ultimately disappointing, ultimately it fails us, it can only fail us, it will never secure us or satisfy us or give us the true significance that we long for. Those things cannot be found from anything or anyone apart from God. In the Old Testament, you might know several places where God said he sort of makes a mockery of the, of the little G gods that people pick. So they pick these other foreign nations' gods, and they worship them, and they serve them. And he says, but they're like statues. You get this statue, it's got eyes, but it can't see. It's got a mouth, but it can't speak. It, it's no savior. And he says, I'm the only savior. And, and to his people, he says, look, you have me. He's pleading with them to see his value, his exclusive value, to see that life for them is being in relationship with him and being humble before him and seeing that he is the source of all things, not we ourselves. So he's pleading with them in this sense, and and it helps, I think, a little bit to consider it on the level that goes deeper than just, well, it's physical object. I mean, you could clear out all the figurines in your house and all the little replicas of whatever you got, animals and whatever else, and that's not going to do anything for this heart problem. And that wasn't really God's point to begin with. His point was this worship issue, this service issue. So now we kind of move to consider that a little bit more. He says, worship, bow down, serve them. As I said, that there was this practice of, um, and it still is, I mean, all around the world, people have their forms of, of idolatry, and we in America have our unique forms, and it always involves sacrifice. So, so in India, people would bring different herbs and, I don't know, articles of clothing, all sorts of odd things that they would sacrifice before their gods. And in America, it's not that way, but you can think of how, how a, a man, for example, might sacrifice his family for his career, or how a person might sacrifice their health because they value a certain form of pleasure too highly or a, a substance of some kind that they are engaged in substance abuse because, because they, they, they value so much what that does for them, how that is a form of salvation for them. They, they sacrifice their own health and their own family and their own relationships for it. Do you, do you see how that works? It's still all the same thing. It's still all that worship issue. It's what we, what we attribute the highest value to. And God says, no, that's, that's death for you. It will never save you, just like the statues. And there's one place in the Old Testament where it says, if they, if they fall over, you got to pick it up. If, if, it's, if that statue's going to get anywhere, you got to pick it up and carry it yourself. It, you have to bear the burden of your God. How, how could that, how is that a God? 
when all it is is a burden to you that can't save you, that has no ability to rescue you. So he keeps kind of um, arguing the case for his superior value. And when he gives the commandments, it's exactly what he's doing. He's not depriving his people. He's not saying, you, you know, you can't ever yeah, have your kids playing with action figures or uh, having pictures on your walls. He's not saying that. He's saying, look, it, it is death to you to put yourself and other things in my place. And that is your natural tendency and has been since the fall. So he pleads with them. And we have to admit that we have our ways of, of doing it. We all do. And humanly speaking, this, this is another inescapable problem. So this is where Paul says in the book of Galatians that the law, including the Ten Commandments, is a tutor. And what's a tutor do? A tutor instructs. And in those days, a tutor was literally the person who lived with the family, or at least partially lived with the family, and would take the child to school them, to instruct them. So this is the law's role, is to get us to life, to get us to Christ, to, to reveal, hey, yeah, this is what we do. We have a, a thousand ways of doing this. This is what we do, and, and we need rescue. And, and it's interesting how God rescues us. Can you catch this, right? Think about how God rescues us. So he has these, these people who have as their tendency to worship and serve things in the created world more than God himself. And here's how he rescues us. He, it's not that God is entirely against any manifestation or representation of his, himself in this world. He's not. He just decides what that's going to be. And so he sends Jesus to live here in human flesh as, the New Testament tells us, as the image of the invisible God. As Hebrews 1 says, he's the exact representation of God's nature. So God says, look, I, I'm not against you seeing me more clearly. I'm not against you having a representative of mine in the world. I just get to determine who and what that's going to be. And when he fulfills that role, he does so by sending Jesus into this world to live and to die in this life of perfect, perfect humanity. And, and I, I, we can't think about that enough. When you talk about evidence for the truthfulness of Scripture, evidence for why Christianity is superior to other religions. I mean, one of the greatest evidences that I know of is this is the one religion which speaks of God humbling himself, coming into this world, living perfectly, experiencing all forms of human temptation, all forms of human suffering, and conquering what we could never conquer. And it ending with him giving himself over to human hatred giving himself over to our rebellion to pour out love for us. Uh, there's just no, I can't think of any greater concept of any, of any God. And this is, this is who our God is. And he, he's just so, so he says here, it fits perfect. He says, um, I am a jealous God. <laughs> he's so jealous for his people. He's like, he is on hot pursuit all the time. And he's seeking to persuade us. Remember back in college, those of us who went to college, you had these argumentative papers and persuasive speeches and you had to come up with reasoning. Like God just continually persuading us. I'm better, I'm better, I'm better, I'm life to you. It's a trap. All you're going to get is more enslavement when you go down those paths, when you try to make things and people and experiences be for you what I alone can be. It's a trap. His relentless commitment to us. The hope we have because of that commitment. Then even when, oh, we like sheep have gone astray, right? Even when we find ourselves going astray, which we all do and we have different ways of doing it, he is still in pursuit, still in pursuit, still in pursuit. That's who God is. That's what he's up to. And he came, Jesus came, it says in Philippians 2, he came in the likeness of men. So there's a likeness for you. Here's God making himself in likeness of men, all part of this, this rescue, rescue mission. All right, so let me, let me wrap it up with this 
one last thing for you to ponder a bit. The second commandment, if, if you heard it right, if you're paying attention to what I explained, it should, in a sense, offend you. It should offend you in a way. Because as God saying to you, it is death for you to make too much of what you make for yourself. It's death for you to see this coming from you and through you and to you. To see this being that which can secure you or satisfy you or invest your life with significance. That is all death to you. He's saying that. And he's saying, and, and I have exclusive right to do that and to, to be in that place. It's like this. Like, think about it. again. God's the, he's the creator. He's the maker, right? So he makes everything. He makes it with his power. It says uh, several different ways. From him, through him, and to him are all things. In Colossians, it says everything's been made through Christ and for Christ. So it says in all different ways. But the idea is he makes these things and they all reflect his glory. They all sort of reflect back his glory. They all find their true value in the fact that they were made by him, not in and of themselves, but in the fact that they were made by him. I love, I get, this is just a side note. There's a great Seinfeld uh, bit he does about how much stuff that we see advertised on commercials is just junk. And he's like, the best time between, the best time is, is that between seeing the commercial and actually getting the thing, because once you get it, you're pretty quickly disappointed by it. Like the best moment is in between before you've even gotten it. It's not all that great anyway. So here, but here's God who says, look, I've made everything in this world. It all came from me. And life for you is to see it that way. And you don't see it that way. And so I sent Jesus to view it that way in your place and to treat everything, including material things, in the, in the proper way, in the appropriate righteous way, and then to impart to you life anyway, even though you don't deserve it, even though you would forfeit it and replace, exchange God for other things. I'm giving you life anyway through Christ. So, so he says, look, I have the sole right, exclusive right to make things in that sense that I ultimately get the credit for. And when that happens, that's life to you. And here's why that should offend you a bit. Because in your humanness, he's communicating, you, like you don't have that right. To, to make things, to attribute value to them, to take the credit for them. He says that's, that's death for you. In a way, he's like saying, look, I can do something you can't. Which gets us right back again to the essence of the gospel, which is God saying, look, your tendency is, and there's another way of looking at it, to try to shrink me down. This is what humans do. Remember, let's come in later. The Israelites in the wilderness, not long after getting the law from Moses, including the one we just talked about. Remember what they craft for themselves? What they craft for themselves? The golden calf. And it's not that they said, hey, this is um, Baal or, or this is Molech. It, they just said, hey, this is the God who delivered us. It's almost like they're saying, hey, this, is, this is Yahweh. This is, this is God. We just want him like this. So we can see him on this level. We can relate a little bit because we know cows, you know, and they're sort of symbolic of... Milk, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Whatever they were, but they shrinking God down, right? So, so, so through the the commandments for our good, you know what God's doing? He's shrinking us down for our good, for our freedom, for our life. He's shrinking us down, and then He comes and meets us there through Christ, who says, "I'm the great physician." who came for the sick, who can realize it, who can realize their problem is their God complex, and I'm here to rescue them, who are enslaved to all the objects of worship that they serve incessantly and get themselves into all sorts of trouble, all sorts of addictions, all sorts of problems plaguing them because of their having to make for themselves little gods to manage and manipulate and get what they want. I'm coming down there to rescue them from themselves. So he puts us in our place. You see that? He puts us in our place. And that's what every one of these commands does. That's what the whole Bible does. And the good news of the gospel, which is a thread from beginning to end, is that God, he loves us. 
He desires to redeem us and make us his own and, and, to, and to grant us the satisfaction and the security and the significance that we will never find anywhere else. It is a gift of grace in relationship with him, not as a result of works, not as a result of us saying, okay, I'm going to conquer the second commandment. At least I'll keep that one. I just make sure I don't have any images. or I, I mean, it's all meant to be humanly impossible so that we would cry out, I, who, will, who will rescue me from the body of this death with Paul? He says, thanks be to God. That Christ Jesus is the rescuer, right? There's no condemnation. So another commandment that is universally, timelessly applicable and points us to the gospel, points us to Christ, the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of his nature so that we can see him clearly and know him and live live in him. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for its clarity. Thank you for commandments and how they represent your pursuit of us and your endeavor to persuade us concerning the truth that we live only in you, not not by what we make with our own hands. There's a great gift that you've given us to, to work and to make things and take pleasure in what we make. But there are so many ways in which that enslaves us as well. And so help us to see that. Help us to see how we do it. Help us to see the root of it, that heart issue, that worship issue. And help us to to look to you for the freedom granted to us in Christ, who is our, our life. So thank you again for the time we've had thinking through this a bit. And we commit ourselves to you next few minutes of discussion to you and in the week ahead to you in Christ's name.